And actually, I would say it's an honor to be with you today. Normally, I give lots of talks to conferences. That's part of my job. But this is a unique opportunity today. Because when I think about this conference, and I think about normally people attending a conference, most people come to a conference, and they're upbeat. They're talking about the great things going on and how good life is, and they're hopefully going to enjoy things. But when I think about the audience here today, hopefully you are upbeat and positive, but I couldn't think of probably a more challenged group of people across our state in terms of facing challenges in your lives and your duties and your profession. And the challenge that we have is how do we go through this difficult period and understand that this is a crisis. But it's a crisis not of fear or panic, it's a crisis of opportunity. It's an opportunity to build for Michigan's future. And so that's why I wanted to come today, is to actually have an open dialogue about the challenges we do face. So, and I appreciate that. But we are all going through difficult times, and it's how can we do this in a thoughtful way as a team, as partners. So I'm going to talk about the Economic Vitality Incentive Program in a couple ways, because the old ways of doing things needed a change. Um, that our system has been broken in many respects. And you look at the role of government and what we need to do to be better, more efficient, and plan for the future. So the idea of that program was to say, it's not about just spending money. It's about showing real results to real people. Because our job is not all about money. It's about showing real results to real people. And I'm really happy to always have the discussion when people walk in to say, this is how we can make a positive difference in our citizens, in our customers' lives. And then have the discussion of where that is on the priority list, and then how do we get the resources to make it happen. And that's one of the fundamental dialogue changes we need to have happen in the public sector. It's not about money, it's about results. And that's what those three key pillars of the Economic Vitality Incentive Program were about. It was about encouraging more accountability and transparency, about having a dashboard, about being held accountable, about doing a citizen's guide to financial statements, about putting the information out there, not just about the cash in, cash out, but where do we stand with our liabilities and our balance sheet. It was about service sharing and service consolidation, about saying in these difficult times, can't we break down some of those barriers with our neighbors to say how we can work together? that those opportunities have been there for decades, but we didn't do them in many cases. Some have been great role models and have been doing them for a long time, but there are more things we can do. It's a time we catch up and recognize the future needs to be different in a, again, not a bad way, but a different way, and how we can be thoughtful and competitive for the long term in terms of providing the best service to our citizens, our customers. So that's the goals of those programs, is to really lay out an opportunity to say, it's not about the past, but building towards a future that is focused on results. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I looked at as we went through the list to say, what are we asking of these communities? There's nothing on that list that we're asking of communities that we are not willing to do ourselves. That is my benchmark. To the degree we ask for things, we want to do it as partners. And we need to do it as partners to recognize we're in this together. Now, as part of that, we also did a number of other reforms. Local government reform was a big topic in March. Actually, I kicked that off with a special message right here in Grand Rapids. And it included this program, but it includes some other things that hopefully are useful to you in many respects. One of them was reforming Public Act 312 and replacing it with Public Act 116. And then we're still wrapping up a few pieces, but we really are wrapping up some good legislation, I hope, to make the concept of service consolidation, service sharing much easier for you. Because we did have structural barriers at the state level. And our goal is to get those structural barriers out of the way so you can partner and work better together. And we are focused on that. One thing I'd also mention is I mentioned the Economic Vitality Program. And many of you looked at the negatives of it, but it also had some positive aspects. We actually set aside $5 million to encourage service consolidation and service sharing as a grant opportunity to say, here's a way for you to work with your neighbors and to actually get some funding to do those things. And I'm pleased to announce the Treasury 
is going to put out an announcement today that the first awardee is taking place. And that first awardee is actually the city of Grand Rapids for doing a partnership. They're going to receive roughly about a half a million dollars because they have come up with a partnership with the cities of Lansing and Flint to better process their income taxes together. So it's about investing back again for the future and having us be a resource in a positive way, not always a negative way in terms of how you view these things. There's also other things out there. Public Act 4. And that's gotten a lot of attention. And people think, wow, that's a challenging piece of legislation. But it was an important piece because the old system didn't work. And the goal there is not to have financial managers. I'm happy to say we have the same numbers we had before in terms of financial managers in cities and communities. That has not gone up at this point. But what Public Act 4 does is a couple things. The old system had no early warning system. The new legislation actually has a partnership system where we can work with communities to help them ever avoid needing an emergency manager. Because the last thing I want is an emergency manager situation to happen. And by putting in a partnership arrangement there, we can work. We can bring resources to the table to help do reviews, to do consent agreements, if that's a viable option, and come up with ways where we can avoid that situation from ever happening where, in the past, there was no other option. And to the degree we ever need PA4, hopefully you can see it can have value because the point there is, in the old days, you could have an emergency manager for a very long time because they didn't have the ability to solve the problems. And my goal with that legislation is to say, the second goal was to say, when required, let them get in there, let them do their work, and let them get out. Actually, I told people coming into this, as they collect the cards, I expect the stack of PPT questions to be this big and the stack on everything else to be about that big. Well, the interesting part is, I understand why you'd have anxiety, because it's another unknown. But as a practical matter, it's been really kind of interesting to me that I've had some people come out and make comments to say, wow, that would be devastating. The proposal they've made on personal property tax would just devastate our community. Well, the interesting part I would mention to you is we've made no proposal. Um, so as a practical matter, we're still studying that issue, and that's why we haven't made a proposal is because it's important to have a dialogue with all of you and your organization because I understand it's really a revenue stream largely to local communities. We didn't have that issue on the MBT issue. That was a state issue. But with respect to personal property tax, the goal there is, is not to harm you. And you wonder, why would we even bring up that topic? And the reason we bring up the topic is, it's to make you more competitive. Because if you look about businesses, industrial job creators, the personal property tax is a major detriment to them. And we're about the only state left in our region that has a personal property tax. So the reason it's even on the table is because the communities that rely the most on it are at a competitive disadvantage to attract jobs to their community. So isn't it appropriate that we say we should study this issue to say if there's a better answer? But we need to have that discussion together, not as isolated silos of the state versus local. One of the themes is how should we be looking at government? And I am bringing a different perspective, and I want to share it with you. Um, one of the ways I view government is we're there to service our customers, as I mentioned. But essentially, we're a customer service business. We're there to create the environment for people to succeed in terms of job creation, in terms of quality of life. And so I, I think it's important that we approach it that way, that we really step back and say, we're there to service our citizens, our organizations, our businesses as customers. And that's part of the idea, again, about going back to accountability, transparency, metrics, dashboards. And that's part of the message, is instead of not communicating all those things, let's be as transparent and open as possible and talk about what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. Because the best way to improve is to measure it. And it's that interesting facet of human nature that when first you hear about dashboards, metrics, grades in some way, the normal reaction is nobody likes that idea. 
But as a practical matter, the question I would ask you is most people don't like that idea because they're fearful that they're going to be in trouble in some fashion. But the reason I like grades, I like metrics and measures, is how do you know how to celebrate success if you don't measure it? I view it as an opportunity for us to show how we're doing things well and how we're getting better and how we're going to be the best. And that's the reason to have those measures. The second theme I want to share with you is how we approach things. And again, we're trying to do things a different way at the state level. And the term I like to use for our decision-making process is a simple one. Some of you have heard it before. It's relentless positive action. And what does that mean? Relentless positive action is all about solving problems. And that is a commitment I made when I took office. If you look at the tough things we've done, we have been taking on structural problems that have been there anywhere from a year to decades to decades, going clear back to the 60s in some cases, that we are going to solve problems. Well, we have a total solution, maybe not, but we're going to make progress on those tough structural issues. And we're going to do it in a way where it's about problem solving and also in a way where we don't blame anyone for anything. The second thing we do is also not take credit because that has no value. Having individual credit go to someone has no value if you don't succeed. And it's really about the team succeeding, about all of us succeeding together. So it's about no blame, no credit, and simply being relentless in solving this problem, take on the next problem, take on the next problem, and just keep going. And that's something I would ask that all of us try to do. Many of you have that attitude already, but I would ask that you think about it in your own organization, in your own jurisdiction. Are you using relentless positive action? And if you're not, give it a try. It works. I'm convinced that's why we've been able to achieve so much at the state level. Because again, we didn't spend time talking about where we disagree. We've spent the time saying, here's a problem, here's common ground, and here's how we can move forward together and come up with a solution. And the other part is, were you thinking about how good things used to be? Or have you been thinking about where they need to be? And then were we thinking about how we're different or how we're in this together? So unfortunately in the state, because of the tough times we've gone through, we built too much of a culture that's too negative, too backward looking, and too divisive. The future of Michigan is not any one of those three. The future of Michigan, and an exciting future for Michigan, is the opposite of those three. It's about being positive. It's about being forward looking. It's about being inclusive. It's about us all recognizing that we have to stop fighting over a shrinking pie. And the solution is to come together as Michiganders and recognize we're in this together. We are partners in this. And we're going to do this by being positive, by looking out to the future to say, let's be the best in the future. And not view change as a negative, but as a neutral, that by us getting involved, jumping in, we can make it something exciting and positive. And then finally, by being inclusive. By recognizing that every time that divisive attitude shows up, and it does show up too often still, whether it be on racial or ethnic lines, whether it's on partisanship, or whether it's on geography. Are you from the west side or the east side of Michigan? Every time that attitude shows up, every Michigander loses something. So we need to be inclusive and recognizing the solution is about winning together. Our goal is to gun to be number one. And we're going to achieve that because we're one big team. So I ask you today, don't be passive, don't be nice. Get some attitude in a positive way. Get some fire, get some passion. And let's go solve some problems. I'm ready to go. Join me.